and bring this meeting to order. Chris. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I just want to read you a, a short little quote by my favorite author, Timber Hawkeye. If we can remain as fluid and adaptable to change as everything else in nature, then life would have no obstacles. Everything would just flow beautifully towards the great unknown. Thank you, Chris. The Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic that stands one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. And the four-way test, it's right over here. You know. Is it fair to all concern? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all? And David, you have a song today. Have a song. We did so well on it last week. We're going to do it again today. America, my country, tis of the sweet land of liberty. Of the I sing, land where my father died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Very good. Thank you. What a great welcome. Happy you can be seated. Do we have any guests today? Mrs. Bachmeyer. I've got my sister-in-law, Caitlin Janicki here, and we should try to recruit her into the club. Welcome, Caitlin. <laughs> and my mom, Lisa Janicki, is here. Nice to see you, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah. I have my husband, Vince, with me today. Hi, Vince. Hi, Vince. How about visiting Rotarians? Do we have any visiting Rotarians today? Okay, no visiting Rotarians, we'll keep moving. Uh, club business, crystal ball meeting next Thursday. Crystal ball meeting next week, next Thursday, right after the meeting, uh, Mike? Okay, right after the meeting. Uh, on March 30th, is, is Rich here? I haven't seen Rich. Rich, I'll just uh, make an announcement here for us. We're looking at an inter-meeting, rotary meeting of uh, Skagit uh, between, um, is it Mount Vernon and us, Rich? Yep, Chris Kamek is the uh, uh, president over there. So we're looking at an evening meeting. That's the fifth Thursday in March. Uh, just have a meeting between the two um, Rotary Clubs. And we're asking Chris to maybe um, bring his ex exhibition to us, maybe, um, if you know what I mean. So, all right. Uh, auction meeting is, is Tim here. I haven't seen Tim. I think he planned on having an auction meeting tonight, but I haven't heard. So uh, unless he's here to follow up on that, uh, no meeting unless he shows up. Um, but I do want to say auction is May 5th. It's coming fast. It's the Kentucky Derby. I know some of the ladies out there are beginning to get their hats. So um, I think maybe some men are too, I heard. But uh, remember, uh, May 5th is the meeting. We just need to start getting our auction items in. And uh, Styles has uh, also volunteered to collect those for us. Does anybody want to say anything on, about the auction other than that? Ruth. See, I know that people who are on Zoom can't hear us without the microphone being used. So I'm being courteous because Eric is online. So I will be starting the dessert auction sign up pretty soon. So be talking to your spouse if they are the baker um, so that you know and have um, that information before I bring the hand out here. I'll have it a physical copy and a um, something that you can sign up online. So we can do it both ways, kind of a hybrid sign up sheet. Um, we'll see how many desserts we need last year. We had a few too many. So I want to make sure we don't have that happen. Although those were fun to give away to the catering staff. They were really excited to have something to munch on. Um, so just be looking for that. I'll email it out and I'll bring copies here so you can sign up either way. Perfect. Thanks, Ruth. 
Tuesday night, we had a board meeting. Uh, we had a lot to discuss. I sent an email last night, just kind of put some tidbits out for you. Uh, we did uh, support the high school wrestling team uh, in their state wrestling board. So uh, we're working on that and we'll get them some money to, to do that. We talked about dues. Uh, this has come up a couple of times. Um, and so the recommendation from the board is to bring it to the members. And so I'll work with Steve, we'll bring a proposal to the members. And what we're looking at, just to give you a, a, an idea, is a three-year phase in. Uh, we know that there's been some escalation of costs with inflation, cost of living. And we're looking at maybe a $50 increase the first year, maybe 25 the following year, and 25 the following year after that to close the gap between what we have in terms of club dues and happy dollars and fines and all of that, we're finding that we have about a four or $5,000 gap that we're trying to cover. So we have not quite a hundred members. So if we look around it up to a hundred, you can do the math, $50 um, per person would bring in about $5,000. So we'll bring that to you uh, shortly and, and hopefully we'll come some to a decision. So by uh, July 1st, when we start asking for your payment, uh, it'll be it'll be there. Questions? Okay. Uh, District Board Governor, Dis District Governor Raj will be here January 26th. Uh, Curtis is uh, working on the dictionaries. The dictionaries are here. They're in the, uh, the district office uh, warehouse. And uh, we're just waiting for Curtis to um, uh, help coordinate that. He's He's on it. And let's see what else we have. Uh, the Anacorda Centennial uh, celebration. Uh, we have two, four, six, I think eight of us already signed up, but there's a couple waffling there. If you have uh, are interested in going to the Anacorda uh, Centennial celebration, it's a dinner. It's in Anacorda. It's at, the, it's at a warehouse close to the shipyards there. It's, uh, pretty nice. I was over there uh, checking it out the other day. I have invitations uh, from Anna, uh, from their club. And so if you want to pick up an invitation from me and uh, um, then we'll just go from there. But it is February 23rd, uh, a little bit of a complication. It is a Thursday night, it is a Thursday night. The other uh, meeting um, auction coming up is uh, the uh, Mount Vernon auction on the 28th, Skagit Rotary auction on the 28th. So I just want to make sure I'm going to read the names of people that I have signed up for. So Chris, Chris, you're still interested in going. Um, Becky and Randy, I don't know if Becky's here today. I'll check with her. Um, Eric Johnson Jr., uh, still interested in going. Uh, Christina and Sheena, and then Ken and Janine, you were looking at that. So get back to me if you're not able to go. We're, we have a table of eight that's being offered to us. So I think that's all I have right now in club business. Um, we do have a new member. So Mr. Brett Greenwood is here and I'm gonna bring Chris Johnson up and we'll induct Mr. Greenwood. Brett is the executive director of uh, business operations and anything else that is designated to him uh, at the school district. He's been there about 11 years now, 11 years. So Chris. Okay. Ruth, I'm going to hand this to you. All timing. Hey, uh, just before I get going, I just want to extend uh, some thanks and gratitude to our membership team, uh, Dan Sims, Louis Requa, Chuck Rule, Mark Men. Um, these guys are fantastic with these uh, new board members or new members to to the Rotary. Um, they uh, quick to answer the call to, to the orientations. And I don't think the four of them have missed a meeting since I've chaired the committee. So just thank you very much to you guys. Uh, appreciate it, gents. President Bell, fellow Rotarians and guests, it is indeed an honor to induct Brett Greenwood as the newest member of the Cedro Woolley Rotary Club. The mission of Rotary is to provide service to others, promote high ethical standards, and advance world understanding, goodwill, and peace through its fellowship with business, professionals, and community leaders. We are not a political organization, but are dedicated to the practice of good citizenship. We are not a charitable organization, but are dedicated to helping our fellow man. 
We are not a religious organization, but are dedicated to the ideals of morality and high ethical standards. We bring together our individual skills, resources, and qualities of leadership to improve the quality of life for people not only in our local communities, but also in communities around the world. Brett, you have been chosen for membership into the Rotary Club of Cedro Woolley because the Rotarians of this club feel that you possess the qualities of leadership in your field, the qualities of personal conduct, the willingness to share those qualities of personal conduct, all directed towards the pursuance of Rotary's mission. It has been said that when a Cedro Woolley Rotarian is asked to perform, the answer is? Yes. President Phil. Fellow Rotarians and guests, please join me in welcoming Brett Greenwood as the newest member of the Rotary Club of Cedro Woolley. And Ruth, do you have any words of wisdom for Brett? As no words of wisdom. He got all those yesterday. All right. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And, and the most important thing in that packet is what, uh, Chris? The bill going up. The bill, the bill, yeah. <laughs> For new members, it's a little bit higher. Uh, Brett, welcome to the club. It's just awesome that you're here. You've made it through, uh, well, Mark Venn hired you. You made it through my tenure and, and then uh, Miriam's tenure. So three superintendents, that's pretty good for a finance guy. Okay. Let's keep moving on. Miss Carey, you have students of the month today. I met Isabel and Isaiah, and they are very upstanding and outstanding uh, individuals. And let's hear about, let's hear about them. Good afternoon, as and I will always start with this. This is one of my favorite days of the month because I get to celebrate the accomplishments of our incredible seniors. And Alyssa and Isaiah are just fantastic role models. And as I read through this, they're also very humble in how they lead and attribute their qualities to amazing parents and just the incredible staff that we have at Cedar Lake High School. So I am really excited to first introduce Alyssa Badak. She is the daughter of Vitaly and Mar Marina Badak of Cedar Lake. Alyssa maintains a 3.8 grade point average while be actively involved at our high school. She's a member of the Drama Club for four years, journalism two years. She's our current ASB secretary, member of Art Club for two years, Poetry Club for two years, and also a member of National Honor Society. Alyssa has earned a total of eight department awards in her junior year and has also earned four credits by taking the stamp test as she is fluent in Russian. Outside of school, Alyssa enjoys painting, working on the clay wheel, sketching murals, practicing theater, and playing with video editing. She also enjoys random historical facts. Alyssa currently works at Target as a fulfillment expert and has been with the Target team for a year and a half. And she previously held an internship at Skagit Theater Camp at Lincoln Theater for over a four week period in July with a small The Jungle Book Kids production. At this time, I'd like to have Alyssa share with her who's here with her today and also what she plans to do after graduation. Hello, everyone. Lovely to be here with you guys today. Um, there's a lot more of you than I thought there would be, but, <laughs> you know. Um, my name is Alyssa, although, of course, you know that because she just said it, but that's okay. Um, I'm here with my mom, Marina, and my dad, Vitaly, who are vigorously filming me right now. Yeah, they take way too many pictures. It's okay, though. Um, uh, after high school, I hate this question a lot, but it's okay. I'll answer it. Um, I have applied to six colleges that I've gotten into already. I don't know which one I'm going to choose. I'm still awaiting. Don't even know what I'm going to do after high school, so I don't have an answer for you there either. Um, come talk to me in like three months. I probably won't have an answer either then. <laughs> but it's, you never know. I, there might be a chance, but 
we'll see. But I, I don't know. So <laughs> thank, thank you. you. The next student that I'm honored to introduce to you today is Isaiah Barreto. He is the son of Renato Barreta of Cedar Woolley. Isaiah maintains a 3.8 grade point average while being actively involved in our high school. While taking honors classes, he is a huge asset to our varsity football team, varsity basketball team, varsity track and field team, lettering in all three sports. Isaiah is what we call a triple threat athlete. He also won Athlete of the Month in the month of February last year, as well as taking eighth in district at the 300 meters hurdles in 2022. Outside of school, Isaiah enjoys hanging out with family and friends, drawing, lifting weights, playing basketball. Isaiah has been drawing for nine years and he has a love for this art. Isaiah has previously worked at McDonald's and he comes from a military family, whereas the eldest child dedication was instilled into his character from a very early age. The pressure to perform well weighs heavy on his shoulders, but with dedication and determination, Isaiah always comes out on top. So I'd like to have Isaiah, um, his dad is at work and not able to be here and his mom lives in Oregon. So I'm just going to pretend that I'm, you know, I get to be the mom as principal of the high school for Isaiah, but I'm excited to have him come to the mic and share where he plans to go after graduation. Hello, I'm Isaiah, and I'm sorry, my voice might be a little shot. I've been a little sick recently. Um, I, I've applied to about three colleges, and I've gotten a scholarship from Montana State. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be going there. And the other two, I'm not sure if they've gotten back to me yet. But I plan to be to go into a four-year university for uh, financial and business. Uh, I want to major in business and finance. And after that, uh, I want to get into real estate and make some money. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Congratulations, you guys. And Alyssa, it doesn't matter. Most of us that go to the colleges, university, we change our majors maybe three times before we settle in. So uh, you'll be okay. Yeah. Congratulations, you guys. Real proud of you. Mark Venn. Okay, uh, Miriam didn't want to walk that far, so I we'll just do it right here. So uh, one of the things in retirement and then when I worked uh, that was really positive was the Hall of Fame committee. And each year the Hall of Fame committee meets and makes nominations and gets nominations for people that in our community and in our school district and could be outside of our school district that have been former students and student athletes get recognized our hall of fame and today we're here to recognize a well-deserved hall of fame person who will be inducted into the hall of fame on february 23rd in the auditorium at the high school at 5 30. i'd like mike janicki to come up here So Mike's usually, he's not usually shy. I think you all know that. So I, uh, he'll get a chance to take the microphone on February 23rd and talk a little bit, but uh, I consider Mike a good friend. And uh, that doesn't always happen when you work with uh, a school board member for the, the amount of time that we worked together, nine years. Mike was on the board for many years and served our students here in Cedar Woolley for many years. He was also a graduate of uh, Cedar Woolley High School. He'll tell you he got a four point in high school. He got one point his freshman year, one point his sophomore year. One point. So he got a four point all the way through. 
But uh, Mike's the, an example of somebody who gives back to his community too. Uh, his involvement with our seal claw wrestling many years ago and in and, and that, but also if you want a job done in our community, ask Mike, because Mike will not say no. And he'll do whatever he can to help all of us. I mean, I look around the room and there's not one person in here who, Mike, you haven't touched their lives in, in, in a positive way. So I think uh, this is probably overdue, but it, it's well-deserved, Mike. And, and uh, my congratulations to you. I'm looking forward to uh, the 23rd of February when we can bring uh, half the auditorium with Janicky family that can come in and help out. And uh, this is a real positive thing. We've got other people that you will know too. They're being honored that night as well. So I, I welcome you all to come, put it on your calendar, February 23rd. We're gonna do the formal induction and Mike, you are more than deserving of that. Thank you, Mike. Pictures, is that what you're getting? Okay. Mike, congratulations. I can't think of anybody else that deserves it more than you. Thank you. I think we have another announcement. One more announcement. Real quickly, uh, Team February, I need to meet with you guys after the meeting right here. Um, still got some programs to fill and some things like that. So thank you. Yep. Thanks, Wayne. Okay. Any other club business before I turn it over to Team February for the raffle? Chris, uh, January. <laughs> uh, yeah, February on my mind. I, I just got a, real, a quick one. Um, I opened up the floodgates on social media today, and I put on the, um, sorry, <laughs> David, you, you distracted me. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, I made an announcement on the Cedar Willie Summer Concert Series uh, that we're looking for bands. So that being said, um, can you raise your hand if you're on my Cedar Willie Summer Concert Series Committee? Anybody? And is anybody in here on my committee for the concert series? All right, I got Sheena, Brian Ronk, Joellen, Steph, Eric Johnson, Tessa, Samantha, Mary, Crandall, and Sue. Anybody? on that list that does not want to take part, email me. Anybody that wants to help me out this year, all the bands, I'm gonna put a list together and it's gonna be committee vote only for our lineup for, for this year. So I need extra help. If you wanna join my committee, I need an email um, before the end of next week because I got a lot of work for you guys to do. That concert series is a lot of fun. We took our grandkids. They played on the playground equipment and Frisbees. The bands were awesome and great. So um, Chris needs a little bit of help. Let's uh, not say, let's all say yes. Okay, Chris, raffle. Hey, we got a raffle. First number. <laughs> 89, 68. Who's got 68? Steve. All right. See, I gave him my uh, ticket and told him it was a winner for him. So what do you get? It looks like uh, North Cascade Quick Lube, $39.50. <laughs> Although I, I think that uh, they'll, uh, yeah. Uh, 20, 2 0. -oh. 2 0. -oh. <laughs> now that's a first. Boy, that's a, a first. Okay, give it another spin. Call a number. Okay, 19. 19, come on. Okay, Julia, give her a spin or take what you got. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Yep, you got the wine from the back room. Okay, we have number 47. All right, our new member. Well, I told you I sold you the good one. Give it a uh, Oliver Hammer. Cool surprise. That's it. That's it. I, I, Thank you, everyone. I, I do want to give Chad uh, some a little bit of a shout out. He's been working on the wheel uh, for the last couple of months. So, Chad, um, if you want to say a few words about where we're at with that. So I'm getting this thing dialed in. And literally the one thing up there that we don't have a gift card anymore. I tried to pull out today, but it's stuck in there. And Steve spins it on the very first spin. <laughs> but besides that yeah we're getting everything dialed in chad thank you for your work on that thank you chad okay sergeant of arms all right so i don't want to take too much time away from our speaker here so uh, i'm going to make this pretty quick i want birthdays anniversaries was it uh two two bucks anybody with a birthday or anniversary this month anybody not wearing their buttons steve you won two of these and you're not one. Oh, you do got it. Okay. Anybody else? How about anybody not signed in because, uh, and I'm going to let you be honest here because I can name about, I can list off about five on here. Anybody not sign in? That's two bucks. All right. Carl, I need five bucks for your cell phone going off during student of the month. Okay, there we <laughs> That's go. Five bucks for her too. <laughs> uh, I want uh, two bucks for all early leavers. Three bucks for early leavers that did not uh, introduce themselves and apologize for not being here to our speaker for the day. And that's all I've got. All right. Okay. Happy bucks. Anybody got anything left? <laughs> I have a I have a happy 30. Um, first, of course, for Alyssa and Isaiah. Um, congratulations for students of the month. And then on a family note, um, it's the first this, this will be the last swim meet that Emma and Wyatt ever swim together. Wyatt made the uh, like a national level meet and it, it happens to be at the University of Tennessee. So he's with Emma on deck. Wow. And he's a senior at Mount Vernon. So, um, and they're both in finals tonight. They swim well enough to swim in finals. So it's pretty exciting. And then the third happy buck I want to share is I just want to thank Mr. Lemley. So about three weeks ago, you know, it was like students in the month and everyone's wrapped up and he was so thoughtful just to be there and like helped me get my coat on, made sure I had my purse and I was heading out the door. And it was like this really kind gesture that someone was extra was taking care of me. So I just thank you so much. I'll give some happy bucks. You know, it's funny this year's my son Hunter senior year. And so you start to recognize some of the faces that come in here for student of the month. And these two are just two of my favorites. Um, they're always a friendly face to me in the hallway. I remember when Isaiah was uh, in middle school, he and Jackson and Hunter would be walking down the road. And if I happened to be driving by, which was quite often because I was working from home, um, I would pick them up and give them a ride home to our neighborhood. And they were just always so polite. And nowadays you don't get that extra polite kid always and always a thank you, always appreciative. And he's still like that today. Um, and Alyssa is always such a joy to see. She always has a smile on her face when she sees me in the hallway and I'm kind of a dork and I get excited when I see the kids I kind of know. And they put up with me. So congratulations. I'm really proud of you. And you are both going to do amazing things.
All right, should we get to the speaker? Or does anybody else have something? Okay. I got some happy bucks. So as most of you know, in August, I was approached by a different real estate brokerage in town and offered a position of managing broker. Well, the problem was I didn't have a managing broker license. Told them that. They said, okay, we still want you to come over, work on it. Well, two weeks ago, I passed my managing broker test. Hey. So I'm official. All right. I was so impressed with the orchestra last week. Um, and if I remember right, and I hope I don't embarrass myself, but Brock, were you not quite involved in, uh, about 2008 in causing that to stay a part of the curriculum? Yeah, thanks, Brock. Appreciate you doing that. <laughs> anyway, congratulations for keeping it. They did an excellent job. I was really impressed. I have happy bucks. Uh, January is um, School Board Recognition Month, and I just want to, in this forum, publicly recognize and thank the school board members in the Cedarly School District, Christina Jefferson, Eric A. Johnson, Danny Russell, Brent Schiefelbein, and Brandon Bond. They give so much of their time and of their energy to provide effective leadership so that our students like Isaiah and Alyssa can thrive. And as a team, they're very cohesive. They ask excellent, insightful questions, and they are in it for all of the right reasons. And not every school district can boast of having an amazing, wonderful school board. So grateful for them and grateful for community partners like uh, Mike Chanicky. There you go. Uh, so I just wanted to welcome Brett into the club. I think this is fantastic. He's a part of it. Um, the city of C.J. Woolley has a great partnership with the school district and have great leadership there in Dr. Mickelson. And it's really a joy to work with them. And especially with Brett, he's got a great sense of humor and he keeps us on track. So he's going to be a great asset to the club. So thank you. Very good. Okay, that leads us to our program. So if you're an early lever, it's uh, $3, remember. <laughs> we have Don Stryker here today. He's the superintendent of the North Cascades National Park. I'm going to let David introduce him. Thank you, Phil. And I want to uh, especially give a shout out to Team January for uh, all their hard work. Um, Hey, and I want to make note of a member, uh, uh, Paula Kelly was a member of Team January. And as we know, uh, uh, Paula died the day after her uh, retirement party at the chamber, which was a very, very special time. So uh, Paula gave me some great ideas and suggestions on what to do. She was going to be here every every week to to lead, to help out. And one of the things she said for a program was, why not chat with Don Strickland at the North Cascades uh, National Park? So I reached out to Don, who's here right now, and and that's the reason why Don is here, uh, because of, of Pola and her, um, her, her help with that. So thank you, Pola. Um, so Don has got a story career. I, I've got his resume right here. I'm not going to read the whole thing, uh, but it's just really, really amazing. A couple of things I want to note. He was a superintendent of the Mount Rushmore National Memorial in 2002 to 2004. He um, uh, went to the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's been married for 35 years. He's got three kids, Ryan, Robert, and Kaylee. So without further ado, I want to welcome and thank Don Strickland for being here today. So Don, you're up. Thank you, sir. I've been given explicit instructions, too, to make sure that I am uh, I respect your time. I understand I'll get hooked if I go over. What a great meeting to have randomly chosen to come to when we have new members. We have the high school students. Um, so many great happy donations. It was so great to hear. Um, and I uh, 
really respect the work that you all do as Rotarians. And, and uh, I was a Rotarian at two of the six parks that I've been at now. Most of the other ones like Denali were too remote. So it would have been a 125 mile drive uh, every Tuesday or Thursday for the meetings. Um, but I really appreciate the work you do. And it's so, um, I, I got such a warm glow as we were reciting the four-way test again, because to me, that's always the essence of what makes Rotarians so special is that they actually believe in that four-way test. And it just ends up being a really trustworthy group. What I hope to do today is just give you a quick overview of your park that you're the gateway to right here. And, um, and talk about a couple of things that are pointed over here. Thank you. A couple of things that are going on uh, that are exciting right now. Maybe I'll just say next slide if that works for you. Yeah. So first thing, National Park Service as a land management agency, right? Some of you may remember the days of the wars between the Forest Service and the Park Service when we came into being here. Does anybody know what the mission of the National Park Service is? I wouldn't expect people to know that. Um, fundamentally, what we do is we preserve unimpaired the natural and cultural resources of our country. What I like to say is we are the keepers of America's coolest stuff for your grandchildren's grandchildren, right? So the important thing there is to remember that we're in the forever business. Um, and we always try to take that long view when we're uh, applying decision-making authority that we have. And uh, here in the North Cascades, we're a relatively young park. Does anybody know what the first national park was. And there's a prize. Yellowstone, nice. Perfect. And do you know what year it was? Even pre-Roosevelt. Yeah, 18, 9, 1872. Super old park. Some people will argue that Mammoth Hot Springs was technically the first one because it was a federal park, but they didn't name it a national park then. So Yellowstone gets the official designation. So here, North Cascades National Park. Hands, anybody know when we were established? So 2018 was the 50th. Any, any guesses? 68, who said it? <laughs> All right. Yeah, so we're a relatively young park. The reason that I bring that up is, um, and I'm not a historian, but I'll tell you, uh, according to my sort of short uh, history of the park service, the relationship that a park has with its community evolves over time. By the time you're a Yellowstone and you're 150 years old, right? people kind of understand the relationship and the expectations are pretty set. By the same token, when I was up at Denali, uh, which was expanded as part of ANILCA, the Alaska National Lands Interest Conservation Act, those people, that was 1980, those people still felt like it was a brand new uh, uh, act that was passed. And there's a lot of resistance in the early days, oftentimes because the feds are pretty heavy handed when we come in and uh, take land to create national parks. Um, so the relationship goes from one that's oftentimes pretty thorny early on to one that's pretty good and well understood at the end. And the sweet spot is in the middle. And that's right where we are right now with North Cascades National Park, right? Not everybody was a fan of setting aside uh, what otherwise would have been Forest Service land for this national park construct. Um, but at this point, we're figuring out what do we want to be when we grow up, right? And what do we want that relationship to be with the community? And I think that's a super exciting time uh, to be in. And so I'm happy to be right in the middle of that. You can see here that this is sort of the national park writ large. And you can see it in the greater context of all the land that we have in this area. It's actually divided into two different pieces, right? Um, and it's bisected by a national recreation area. The reason for that was the hydropower was in place and it's against the park services rules to have hydropower uh, in a national park. So we actually have three different designations 
in the national park complex here. One is the national park itself, which is just shy of 750,000 acres. So it's a pretty, pretty big size. Um, but I can give you a reference point. So Yellowstone's a 2 million acre park. We're about a million acre park. Denali's a 6 million acre park, right? So we're about a half a Yellowstone, uh, pretty sizable, not quite as big as Olympic, a little bit bigger than Mount Rainier. In terms of uh, the, the complexity in the budget, um, we have an operational budget of about $7 million a year. That's half of what similarly sized parks um, have. And that's been my biggest challenge is operating on such a shoestring budget. I, you know, I come from Denali, which is about the same in terms of complexity, uh, most recently from Denali. That's about a $14 million budget, right? So about twice the number of staff to accomplish the mission. And I think part of this is you may have seen references referring to North Cascades National Park as one of the least visited parks. That's a little bit of a misnomer. And maybe the most dangerous park, right? More deaths per capita. Um, the reason for those um, perceptions is that we separate visitation into the three different areas, whether it's the rec area, the park itself, or Lake Chelan uh, National Recreation Area. And when you do the math that way, the only people who actually go into the park proper, we can only count from the backcountry permits they get, right? So there's only about 30,000 people a year that actually go into the park proper, as opposed to about a million, um, a million a year if you count all three of the different areas. And I don't know about you, but from my perspective, when I'm driving up Route 20, I'm certainly enjoying the park because I'm looking at those majestic peaks, right? So it's it's a little bit strange to me that we do the math that way. Um, but if you go to the next slide, you can see um, we're known for doing a variety of things, right? This is, and mostly these are just pretty pictures while I talk. And most of what I'm gonna do is just serve up a couple ideas and then try to give you time to ask questions, right? Um, but we're, we're known for a lot of things, obviously scenic vistas, um, we have lots of recreation, 300 miles of trail that horsemen like to like. We're a climbing Mecca for a lot of people. Some people choose to take their life in their hands and ride bikes up all the way up <laughs> Route 20. Um, not something I'm very fond of. Next slide, please. I feel like the park um, for many decades, probably for the first 30 or 40 years, was not really well known within the National Park Service system, or even here in the Pacific Northwest, right? Everybody knew about Mount Rainier. And North Cascades was kind of known as that wilderness place. And so we grew up with a lot of ologists, different kinds of biologists, right, um, who, who were doing science and really focusing on uh, the resources, the natural resources in the park. My biggest challenge now is that's, that's all changed, right? This notion that people don't understand um, that North Cascades is a national park is just flat not true. If anybody's driven up Route 20, even on the weekends, you see that. People are constantly going in and out of the park. Um, we're at about a million visitors a year now. We're, we're discovered. Um, part of that's been the dramatic growth. The last time I was in this part of the world was, uh, was 20 years ago, right? When I was at then Fort Clatsop, now Lewis and Clark. And uh, when I came up and visited, it didn't seem too busy. Boy, when I got back here, driving the I-5 corridor, looking at our real estate prices, a lot of things changed in the last 20 years. And so a big one that I wrestle with is the impact on the park. We have major medicals and searches and rescues and all kinds of those factors that you hear about people, um, people who need to get rescued from climbing accidents. And it just really stresses the seams. If you have you know, if you have only four law enforcement rangers to cover a million acres, um, it gets pretty stressed out pretty quickly. So that's one of the biggest challenges that I think that we've had. A second challenge that we have is the FERC relicensing. And I'm not sure if anybody um, is familiar with this notion of the FERC relicensing, but Seattle City Light operates the hydropower, the three dams up valley. Right, and they have for since about the the mid 1920s. We provide between 20 and 25 percent of Seattle's uh, electrical power 
through that relationship with um, Seattle City Light. Well, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission authorizes those hydropower dams and their 30-year uh, license is coming to an end. As part of the process for negotiating a new license, the, um, the operator is required to um, come to terms with the communities that hydropower impacts. And so we're in the middle of this lengthy negotiation to try to figure out what the license terms are gonna be over the course of the next 40 or 50 years. And on the surface, that's a pretty ho-hum thing, but man, it gets really complicated um, with lots of different stakeholder interests involved. Some of the tribes that would like to see uh, fish really highlighted. Of course, flood control is always a big piece of the equation, right? How much water do you let out and what is the impact on that with respect to fish? How full would we like to see the, the pools for the recreators that want a boat and, and, and have access to put their boats in? Um, so that's the second sort of most important thing that's eating my lunch these days. The third thing, if you go to the next slide, is this topic of grizzly bears. And I wanted to just, and you can just sort of um, work your way through these slides. Grizzly bears is a topic that's come up in the press lately. Has anybody heard about it in the news or are y'all? Yeah, so that anybody wanna vote now whether they like grizzly bears or not? <laughs> okay, so I, I spent a lot of time over in Stahican and I get an earful on, on that side of the mountain range. Um, grizzly bears is an interesting topic. I come at this from an interesting and, and different place since my formative years were in Yellowstone where we reintroduced wolves. And that was one of the starting points of grizzly bear um, recovery for the country. Um, and then I spent the last 10 years in Denali National Park where of course, if you're hiking anywhere, you're dodging grizzlies all the time, right? Um, having lived among them though, I have a different sense, I think, than, than, than I did when I, certainly when I was in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., um, about this magnificent creature. Um, the bottom line, though, is um, grizzly bear reintroduction um, is a policy that the government, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, decided on decades ago. And the recovery has been taking place in several different parts of the country. Right. Even though we're the number one area in terms of the habitat back in 1972, um, the Yellowstone ecosystem, this area in Montana, um, a little bit in Idaho and um, the Selkirks up here have all had active grizzly bear recovery programs and actually are probably at a point where um, they could be delisted. And in fact, there have been petitions to delist in uh, in the other areas. We're the newcomers. What we've basically done in this ecosystem is protect the habitat um, so that if grizzly bears choose to sort of wander in from wherever else they exist, then um, you know they'll have a welcome place to to, to be. And that's the that's sort of the mode of operation that we've been in for the last forty or so years. Um, there's a perception that maybe that's not working, right, to actually get this species back here if we are going to try to recover them, and that what we might need to do is to more take a more active hand, actually trapping some of the bears from other areas. And by the way, we're not talking about the big, fat salmon-eating bears that you see in Fat Bear Week from Katmai, right? We're, we're more talking about Denali-type. I, I like to call them the the small vegetarian bears that we had in Denali. Literally 90% of their food is plants and bugs. Um, and very little is actually protein in the form of big game. Counter, sort of counter to what you might think, right? Unless you count the ground squirrels, at least in, in Denali, they like to go along and, and pull the ground squirrels out um, or get the ones that the buses run over on the road. Uh, but anyway, so, while people are engaged in this conversation about should we actively try to bring grizzly bears back to this ecosystem, um, I noticed something interesting that was going on in Canada. And that's just across the boundary line, the Canadians all of a sudden, who for the last 10 years have been sort of lukewarm about the notion of bringing back grizzly bears into this part of the country, have decided to get very, very active. And it's particularly driven by the First Nations in Canada 
and they're actually going to start trapping and relocating grizzly bears to just north of the border. And of course, grizzly bears don't have passports or no boundaries, right? So it stands to reason that they may be down here before you know it. There's this little tricky section of the Endangered Species Act that not a lot of people know about. It's called a 10J experimental population rule. And what 10J says is if you have an experimental population, in other words, if you don't have an established population, you can decide on different rules for how you're going to manage those endangered species. And given my experience in Yellowstone, being able to actually work with your neighbors to define how should we treat bears? Where do we want them? Where don't we want them? If they wander into areas that we don't want them, what are the management tools that are going to be at our disposal, right? We don't want to just be stuck with shoot, shovel, and shut up. Um, I think we want to be able to actively haze and actively relocate. So from my mind, when I first got here a year ago, I said, oh my gosh, if Canada brings in these grizzly bears, and if they wander down here to where it's an established population, we're not going to be able to do the 10J management protocols. We're going to be stuck with the normal fish and wildlife rules um, that say that you can't, pretty much can't do anything. And so I was very aggressive in saying we should take a look and have the public input now to try to get one of these 10J experimental population rules put in place at the same time as we're trying to figure out how to deal with grizzly bears. So that's what's going on right now. For about the next year, we're going to be talking about grizzly bears with the, all of our affected communities. Um, and I just wanted you to be able to associate a name with a face on that topic, even though I know it's controversial. I'm happy to go anywhere and talk to anybody about sort of what people think um, and, and to listen and to have pies thrown in my face if that's, if that's what it takes. Um, but to talk seriously about what some of the finer tune, finer points of, uh, of this 10J complicated experimental population um, thing is. So um, I think with that, um, those are sort of the big three things that, that are going on right now. There's all, all kinds of interesting politics in the, in the Park Service. Um, I'm always happy to talk about that. We've got lots of really cool science going on, whether it's the Fisher reintroduction or the Butterfly Project. We can do a deep dive on any topics that are interesting to you guys. Um, and I just, I throw that out there because we're sort of at your disposal for sharing information. Um, and and while I'm sort of boring, the actual people who know the background science are really, really exciting. And um, and I would just throw it open if anybody has any questions or if they want to, um, you know, take a vote on bears, even though it's not a vote. I have, I'll just say I have brochures here too and my card, so you, you can get a hold of me later. Yes, sir. Uh, interesting about the bears. These bears, you say, are kinder, gentler, and vegetarian. That's kind of nice. Are they the same ones that we see in Yakutat, Alaska, the, the big brown bears? Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty hard on, on garbage cans. Uh, what are, what is the, uh, my real question is tell us about the butterfly project. Is it Monarch butterfly or something? What is, what is it? Well, so the butterfly project is actually just a, 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 an interesting volunteer project that we have where every summer we send volunteers out with nets and they're running around like, um, the sound of music, the hills are alive, right? Um, capturing butterflies and identifying them. And we've, actually found new species of butterflies. So that's kind of a cool thing. The other tickler I'll put out here, I see that this rot this rotary, like many other rotaries, is really engaged in um, education. My wife is a school teacher. She's teaching uh, science, chemistry, and physics at Concrete. Um, she was the science teacher in Denali. One of the things that we've done over our career, though, is try to grow um, a better relationship with communities. And we've had a long partnership with the North Cascades Institute, right? With predominantly fourth and fifth graders. We wanna build off of that and actually do something that we called intensives, where we would take high school students for the first or the last week of the school year 
and have them immersed in the resource following natural resource tracks or cultural resource tracks and actually get an in-park residential experience. Um, fabulous, fabulous programs. Um, we've done things like rangers in training. Um, and so we're really going to be look to, looking to build on programs like that and to try to figure out how we can get, um, you, you know, more of the high school students uh, really engaged in some of the work that we do um, and try to create park rangers for the future. So that's another interesting area um, that you bring up. If you want, I can sign you up for the butterfly project too. Only <laughs> as long as I'm not singing, right? <laughs> Um, I have a question. Yes, sir. So in 2018, I got all these hunters in our family. They uh, they weren't hunting, but they were uh, in the park, and they uh, uh, came upon two grizzly bears uh, in the Cascade uh, Pass area. And to, and so, is there any danger of like bringing in a disease or anything where if you have some grizzly bears there? um that you know bringing in grizzly bears from another area i mean is there a chance i mean how does that i guess i don't know how this how that works yeah that's a good question i actually don't know the answer to that it's not like um like alpacas are to the potential for a vector to a sheep population um i'm a hunter too by the way elk elk is sort of the thing that i do every year um back back in in wyoming yeah <laughs> shoot more <laughs> i like it i like it where where are those property owners <laughs> if i could get my subsistence permit here um you know that's it's a really good question and that's something that we'll actually be analyzing is what what are the impacts I, as i understand it bears are not typically vectors um, for any kind of disease to to other bears um but you know i mean if you if you've hunted around grizzly bears you know they they Grizzly bears tend to avoid people. Um, black bears are actually much more dangerous, in my opinion, um, um, than, than, than a grizzly bear. The grizzly bears always run away, unless you surprise them, right, with their young. Um, so you are literally singing, I think of Eddie Murphy, right? Roxanne, if you're, if you're doing that while you're going down the trail, then, uh, then I think you're in good shape. So mindful of time, three minutes left, probably last question. Uh, does the National Park Service have any plans to build a drive to uh, RV park uh, anywhere beyond Colonial Creek in the future? The, there's nothing on the planning horizon right now, but it's a perfect time to ask because as we're in this relicense with Seattle City Light, and by the way, one of the neat things, the way FERC used to operate is they would give the licensee a permit and then require them to give the land management agency a bunch of money. That's not the way they work anymore. So we used to get a bunch of money from Seattle City Light to actually do things like that. But as we look at what visitor services we want in the recreation area, now is the time to negotiate that and to ne negotiate those terms in. So um, in about two months, we're gonna be having de design charrettes. Uh, and we've definitely heard that. We just did an accessibility survey last year and we've definitely heard that we need um, we need more RV. The, the, the hard part with our park is it's really vertical, right? So there's just not a lot of not a lot of places to put stuff um and if you have ideas about that i'd love i'd love to hear it yeah good point point. and it doesn't necessarily have to be in the bright line boundaries of the park either one of the things that i'm thinking about is if we have a need for more of these um traditional visitor services that you would come to expect in a national park right mostly now it's new halem it's like a it's like a company town C could we convert some of that could we look at the land in between Marble Mount and the boundary of the park, and as part of the licensing package, um, really try to sort of bootstrap that area into more of a sophisticated gateway um, with with visitor services that include overnight accommodations and probably car chargers. Right? I see a lot of Teslas. Um, I, there is a secret charging spot. 
if if you go up there and you have an electric car, I can tell you where the secret charging spot is. I think it's in front of Building 70 in in New Halem. I think that's the building number. So excellent question. I will hang around too if people have more questions. Um, and the reason I came is so that you can see what I look like, and I'm available to come to you or for you to come to me anytime, any place on any topic that's important to you. Right? It's your national park after all. Survey says. I yeah, good good question. <laughs> okay, I think we created a new member. We're going to get to our uh, 100 um, member uh, goal here. So Don, we'll be talking to you a little bit a little bit later. I like it. I like it. I want to know what the expectations are about committee assignments, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A, Don, thank you very much. We really appreciate your presentation. And I do have a, a parting gift for you, Don. This is from the greatest Rotary Club in the universe uh, for you to sign all those uh, important documents that you have and, and maybe the application process to uh, the Cedar Rule Rotary. Thank you. I would vote yes. Okay. Okay, with that said, um, I wanna thank the students of the month, Alyssa and Isaiah. Carrie, nice job bringing them in. And Caitlin, are you still here? No, nope. uh, so welcome, Lisa. Thanks for coming again. Vince, it's always great to see you. Thanks for coming in. And Brett, welcome to the club. Uh, we uh, are already assigning you committee uh, assignments, so uh, watch your email. You'll get that. And Mike, congratulations one more time. I can't think of anybody that deserves a community award than you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So remember, uh, Team February, right after here, uh, after the meeting here, right here at this table, Crystal Bar uh, Ball next week. And that will do it for the greatest Rotary Club in the universe.